Feminist Creativers presents a word for every generation that knows no fashion. Greetings. I hope and trust. I find you well, my dear friends. We are on the second installment on the series Family Togetherness. I welcome you as we join the Breath of Life SDA Church in Britain. And we want to consider the title or subtitle Supporting Young People in Families and Church. I invite you, my dear friends, before we spend a moment in prayer to the book of 2 Kings. We begin reading at chapter 12 and verse 1. The Bible reads as follows. In the seventh year of Jehu, Joash became king, and he reigned in Jerusalem 40 years. His mother's name was Zebeah. She was from Bisheba. Joash did what was right in the eyes of the Lord all the years Joida the priest instructed him. May the good Lord bless the reading of his word as we spend a moment in prayer. Let us pray. Kind and gracious Father in the heavens above, we are about to go into your word. How we pray that we may be instructed as the Joashes of today. I pray for the young souls that are in our homes. Young souls that had even families, for they have lost all their parents. I pray for the children that are under our custody. Dear Lord, may you bless one and all. May they find refuge in your word, and may they find refuge and solace in our families. Be with us for this night as we go through this study once again. In Jesus' name we pray and ask, Amen. My dear friends, just allow me to raise five points as is our custom. As we begin considering our text which establishes our discourse, we find herein that Jehu has been leading the family or the ten tribes of Israel for seven years. On the other hand, then we find that Joash has ascended to the throne and he goes on to lead for 40 years. There seems to be something that has happened here. And the Bible gives us an insight into this by drawing some parallels and some dots that we should connect. Jehu is the king of Samaria or the king of Israel, while Joash is the king of Judah, the king of Judea. Who are those in the family of Judah? Remember, as David lost the... Um, the, 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 the ten tribes that were lost after Rehoboam came to power after Solomon. There was Rehoboam and Jeroboam. Jeroboam was one of his army personnel who later on went on to lead the ten tribes. These became known as Samaria or as Israel. This is where Ahab and Jezebel came to be king and queen. While in the throne of David, this is where now Rehoboam goes on to have descendants who rise to the throne. And it so happened that one of his descendants by the name Jeroam got to marry the daughter of Jehoram, got to marry the daughter of, um, what's her name, Jezebel. Now, this daughter of Jezebel was known as Atalia. And Atalia, upon giving birth to Ahaziah, Ahaziah had a brief stint in power. When Ahaziah died, now Atalia, the queen mother, ascended to the throne and began to assassinate all the children that were born to his son Ahaziah so that she can remain in power to consolidate her position in power. Now the Bible starts in chapter 12 by giving us this particular connection to say Jehu has been ruling for seven years. Why has Jehu been ruling for seven years? Jehu is the one who brought the reign of Jezebel to an end. You remember it was prophesied that when Jezebel was going to die, she was not going to be buried. Now Jehu came riding on his chariot. As he came, he then found Jezebel already having done her makeup and seated by the balcony. And Jehu then ordered the servants to throw um, Jezebel down. And Jezebel was cast from the rooftop 
and bashed to the floor. As she was bashed to the floor, it is said the dogs ate her, but they would not eat her skull and her hands. And I think her feet too. All these instruments that she used to sing, the dogs could not even touch them. Now chapter 12 then says, Jehu has been in authority for seven years. And it has been seven years of hiding for Joash, who has been hiding from his um, grandmother, Atalia. Now Jehu needs to be referenced so that we know that the end of the house of Jezebel is not yet complete until Joash ascends to the throne. The ascension to the throne of Joash marks the end of Jezebel's reign, the end of Jezebel's influence, and how does this work having done this background? We need to appreciate that when the young man, when the young lad, when the toddler, Joash ascends to the throne, it is on account of Jehoiada that he continues to do well for 40 years thereafter. So he must have ruled, ruled until he was 47 years or thereabout. So now for this young man, Joash, to do so well on the throne, he does so well exceptionally because Jehoiada, the priest, is the one who gives him instructions. He's the one who gives him counsel. He's the one who directs him and gives him sound moral advice in decision making. What am I saying unto you? As we live in our times, young people cannot be safe if they are not going to be given moral guidance from the word of God. Young people cannot be safe if they're not going to be given opportunities to learn from the Bible, especially in schools. We have come to an era, we have come to an epoch where the, the Bible is now something that is being gotten rid of in the Bible. Now, I mean, in the school curriculum, under the auspices of religious inclusivity. The religious liberties that are there have made it mandatory, especially for state institutions, not to align themselves to a particular religion, Christianity in this case. And what does this mean? Most of our children are being raised to be morally bereft because they do not have moral counsel. We all need a priestly council. It might not be the priest that comes in today and is no more tomorrow, but we need, over and above all, the priest who, who will never retire, the priest who sits and ministers in the heavenly temples, the high priest of the book of Hebrews. Jesus Christ is the ultimate high priest that you and I need in order for I, young people, to be safe both in the families and in the church. We need the guidance of the high priest in the workspaces. We need the guidance of the high priest in our professional spaces. We need the guidance of the high priest in our homes. We need the guidance of the high priest in our churches and in every sphere of our life. We need that moral compass from the high priest for he has promised that he will never leave us, not leave us alone, neither will he forsake us. But he has left us with the Holy Spirit. Who is going to teach us? Who is going to remind us? Who is going to ensure that he empowers us to do that which the high priest expects of you and I? Point number two. Now, as Atalia goes on this rampage of assassinating, of extinguishing, emanating all the children of Ahaziah, her son. Now you'll notice that the Bible says, as you go back into the book of um, 2 Kings chapter 11, the Bible says it so happened that Atalia went on a murdering spree. And as she was murdering, it was a targeted murdering. All the children of the king were rooted out one by one. Why is she doing this to consolidate power? This was a then cannibalism. Of course, nowadays, she would have been uh, arrested and brought in for, for, for a genocide or any or, or of those crimes against humanity. 
But what Atalia is doing may not be too far from what some of our grandparents are doing, what some of our aunts are doing, what some of our mothers are doing, unlike Zibia, who is mentioned as the mother of Joash. Because Joash did so well, now you're going to find that his mother is mentioned alongside him. When children do well, their mothers get to be mentioned. When children do so bad, even their mothers, when they are mentioned, they are mentioned so that they go down with them for having failed to do their part. But this woman, Atalia, is mentioned as a standalone, one of the few women in the Bible who are as assumed the position of a ruler of a kingdom. You're going to find that maybe at no point in the history of the Jews was there ever a queen to sit on the throne and rule. We did have a queen in the context of Esther. We did have a queen in the context of Jezebel. But no queen rose to the position of being a ruler. While Atalia, you, you know, occupies a, a position of eminence, the way she went about it has eclipsed the, the good shit that she did. She, she would have been the beacon of all women to say women can lead. But I'm sure no woman would want to be associated with the style and leadership, uh, I mean, traits of Atalia. What Atalia did was she sought to eliminate kith and kin. How many of us are going to say she was a good ruler to go out after her own grandchildren and make sure they are all killed so that she can rule? Is it possible that some of our parents are going all the way out to kill their children figuratively so that they can sit well. They are not going to do anything to ensure longevity of life for their children. They would rather cut their lives short so they can become the lady of the town. They will cut their lives short so they can become the main attraction. What are we doing as parents? Are we any better than Atalia who goes out to kill her grandparents? Are we making decisions for our children? Atalia has gone out to kill her own grandchildren. Are we making any decisions that are going to ensure that when we are gone, our children will continue to be alive? When we are gone, our grandchildren will continue to rise to positions that we hold today? If we cannot do so, then the future of our children is in peril. Their future is in jeopardy. We are Italians. We may not take up the machetes. We may not take up the swords. We may not use the poisons. But because we are not instructing them in the name of modernity, we are killing those children. Because we are not telling them, no, my child, this you shall not have. We are killing these children. They go off with an entitlement, thinking that everything in life is to be served to them on a silver platter. When life does not give them that, guess what? They are dead. They are dead. And who killed them? They were killed at home. They were killed by their parents in the name of love. At point number three, notice this. While Atalia is going on a killing spree, Every family may have an atelier, but I also want to submit every family also happens to have a Jehoshiba. Jehoshiba was the aunt to this young man, Joash. And Jehoshiba is the one who then, upon learning that Queen Mother is on an eradication mission, she then went out to reclaim young Joash from the nursery where she, he was being kept and he was extracted from there and deposited in the temple. No matter how evil your family may be, no matter how evil your parents or grandparents may be, there is no family without a Jehoshiba. May I make an appeal this evening and say, be the Jehoshiba in your family. Do not be the Atalia of your family. Be the one who see that the young are supported. Be the one who shall see to it that the young are secure. Be the one who shall see to it that the young are safe. They grow up.
to realize that which is rightfully theirs, that which the Lord has prepared for them, how I pray that you can be the Jehoshiba of your family. Be the Jehoshiba of your family. Point number four. Now notice this. Who is this Jehoshiba? Jehoshiba is the wife to Jehoiada. You know, these are complicated names. Jehoshiba, wife to Jehoiada. Jehoiada is the priest who was giving instructions to Joash, who continued to do well because Joash gave him instructions. So who is this Joaida? I, I wish I could come up with um, an, an English term of who this Joaida is to, to Joash. But in, in, in my mind, the husband to your aunt, I'll just call him an uncle. So Joaida is an uncle to Joash, and Jehoshiba is an aunt to Joash. Now, Joaida, in his official capacity as the high priest, takes care of Joash as an heir to the throne. Joaida, in his familial capacity as an uncle, takes care of his nephew, Joash. Now let's come home. Jehoshiba does not have an official capacity, but she is an aunt to the king. She now goes on to discharge her family duty of taking care of her brother's son. May I talk to the aunts out there? Where are your brother's sons? Where are your sister's sons? Are they taken care of? Or since they died, you have never checked on the Joash. If you have not checked on the children of your brothers, whether they be half-brothers, biological brothers, if you have not checked on them, then the children have no support, both in the family and in the church. These two that I find here are an example of family and church support coming together so that the children can be safe. As you read in chapter 11, you're going to find that what they did is that they taught him how to be a king. For this, he was not going to be taught by his father, for he was no more. He could not have been taught by Zebir because he was taken as a young lad along with the nurse to be kept in the temple. If ever there was a place where young people will be kept, I wish they'll be kept in churches and not in orphanages. I wish they'll be kept in the word of the Lord and not be nursed and reared by TV and commercials. They need to be grounded in the word of the Lord and they shall come out, speak and span. At seven years, they'll be ready to rule. At seven years, they'll be ready to become kings. And Joyd takes this time to marshal the Levites. Did you know that the Levites also had an army? The Levites now had to play God. There was no Sunday for them. There was no Sabbath for them. Seven days a week, 24 hours a day, they stood guard over Joash to make sure the young man's life was safe. With the presidential and um, the kingly royal guard that he had, it was now heralded on the seventh year. The king was now set on the throne. Atalia, thinking that this was her coronation, thinking that people were celebrating her rulership, lo and behold, a new king had ascended to the throne. A new king had been set up. She came through only to find she was the former queen mother. She was taken out through the gate and slaughtered to death. The family of Jezebel had no more influence the works of evil had no more influence in Judea and in Samaria. How I pray that the works of the evil one will not have a hold or influence in your family or in my family. For the Lord Jesus Christ, when he came, he exemplified how children ought to be supported, how children ought to be commended. As we leave the story of Joash, I want you to come with me for the last time as we climax to Matthew chapter 18, we we'll start reading at verse number one. It reads as follows. At that time, the disciples came to Jesus and asked, who then is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? He called a little child to him and placed the child among them. Verse three, 
And he said, truly, I tell you, unless you change and become like little children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. And whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. This was Christ as he made room for children that all who live on earth should become childlike and not childish. Spare me just a few more moments to tell you the history of this child, the child that Jesus called and made an illustration of humility upon his life. His name was Ignatius, who later became the Bishop of Antioch. His name was Ignatius, who later became the Bishop of Antioch. In the time of Emperor Trajan, who was one of the ruthless emperor to rule during the time of the Roman Empire. Roman Empire is known in the Dark Ages for having martyred many believers. As this Trajan came to uh, the town where Emperor Ignatius, I, I, I mean um, Bishop Ignatius was in control, he then brought him along. And he was scourged. The Romans specialized in um, what I would call torture. They tortured in style. This is why even when they developed the cross, the cross was used as a Roman instrument of torture, even though it has become a, 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 a symbol of Christianity. It was a reminder of how ruthless the Romans could be. Now they took Ignatius and flogged him. And how they would flog, the Romans had two ways of flogging someone. It is either they sliced you with um, a whip. This whip had um, a knife-like edge. So when they sliced you, they, they, they would lace that with vinegar. So that where it slices you, as it slices into your flesh, the vinegar is going to be deposited in the flesh. And you're going to get that itching and very painful, painful feeling. And the other flogging that they used, they will get hones, I mean bones, and, and, and they're going to have um, sort of like a lash that has uh, finger-like straps at the end. But what they will do is they will tie these bones at the end of the strap so that as they flogged someone, as they scourged you, what those bones will do is that they will dig into your flesh and then when they pull the whip back, they will come out with flesh extracts from the body. So Ignatius was flogged in this way so that he should recant and forsake the faith of Jesus Christ. But Bishop Ignatius refused to turn away from the Lord. Why? Because as a little child, Christ had touched him. As a little child, Christ had ministered to this child and he was grounded in the faith to make him even more sure of his conviction. John, the revelator, had baptized the young man Ignatius and set him on the path of salvation, on the path of faith. When the flogging would not make him give up, when the flogging would not make him give up, they then took it to the next level. They took uh, what was like bowls of uh, cotton and they would dip these in something like gasoline or petroleum and then they will make him hold these in his hands and set them on fire. And he was made to hold fire with his hands. But even then, even then, his experience of guidance and instruction in the faith as a little child kept him holding on. Even with fire in his hands, he will not let go of his faith. Should I go on? As if that was not enough. The Romans were specialists, I tell you. This is the other thing they would do. They would take papers, papers, paper, paper, no more paper. And then they would dip them in oil. Having dipped them in oil, they would, they, they, they would then clip them onto someone's skin. Having clipped them onto someone's skin and, and you'd be having layers and louvers of paper like that, then they would set those on fire. You are not going to fully ban, but you're going to partially ban 
every part of your skin will be singed. Ignatius went through that. Should I go on? The man was relentless. He could not give up. He had loved Christ as a little child and he was prepared even to die for him. When this wasn't working, guess what they did? They brought in pincers. A pincer is something that looks like a pliers, but it has sort of teeth on both sides. And what they used with these pincers is they used to bite the flesh out and separate it from his bones and called upon him to curse Christ or die. And like Job... He refused. He loved the Lord and he loved him with all his heart. And when they realized this wasn't going to work, guess what they did? They then took him into the arena. At least let me say whatever remained of him into the arena. And they allowed, they let loose the wild animals to ravish him and tear him to pieces. This is a sad story of a church that would take the lives of young ones. But when the little ones have come to the faith, they are safe. They are safe in spite of what comes their way. When they remain alone, they will stand for the truth even if the heavens fall. They will stand for the truth even if it means loss of life because they are grounded in the faith and in the love of Jesus Christ. My dear friends, as we come to the end of this crusade, as we come to the end of this art discourse for this evening, I want to challenge you. Let every child be safe in your home. Let every child be supported in your family. Let every child be supported in your church. Let there be no more Ataliyas. Let there be Jehoshippers. May we have more of Jehoiders who will make sure the young people are safe at a young age. They will be safe even when they assume what is their rightful position. May I pray for the one last time, for families and the young people. Kind and gracious Father, in the heavens above, thank you, dear Lord, for the privilege of young people. In the past, they have not been safe. In our time, they continue not to be safe. Dear Lord, start with us, their parents and relatives, so that we may do that which is right. And when we are right by them, they are going to flourish and they are going to do what you have intended for their lives. May you bless some of our children who are orphaned, like Joash. May you bless some of our children who are born into stable families. Bless some of our children who are born into single-parented families. And bless some of our children who have been fast-tracked into adulthood and they lead child-headed families. Oh, dear Father, in the heavens above, may your eye that is ever so watchful be upon the lives of each and every child watching and represented here. I pray for children who are going to love you even if it means loving you to death. But even more, I pray for children who will live for you in the schools, live for you in preparatory school, live for you in high school, live for you in college, university, and in the homes. Dear Lord, we pray for such children this time and in our time. In Jesus' name we pray and ask. Amen. My dear friends, let us meet tomorrow evening at 20 hundred hours and we shall be looking at the challenges of parenting. May God bless you until we meet again.